I'm going to show you guys what you need to do to dominate your fantasy baseball drafts coming up on Beat the Odds. Don't go anywhere. Hello sports fans and welcome back to another episode of Beat the Odds. I'm going to walk you through some of the things that I do to dominate my fantasy baseball drafts. If you like this content, please smash that like button. And a special thanks goes to all of our subscribers who have been watching these videos as you now account for 25% of all viewers. To the other 75% of viewers that haven't yet subscribed, I encourage you to do so as it helps me create these videos for you. For simplicity's sake, I am going to be focusing in on Yahoo and ESPN Fantasy Baseball Leagues. This episode is brought to you by Thrive Fantasy Sports. Use the promo code BEATTHEODDS to double your first deposit up to $250. And first time users get a free square, like tonight, if you bet on LeBron to score one point, and he does, then you win. Now, if you're new to all of this, you may benefit from a quick crash course on fantasy baseball. Let's start by defining the three main types of leagues. We've got head-to-head -head leagues, where you compete against other managers by accumulating stats every week. We have rotisserie leagues, where you compete against managers by accumulating those stats throughout the season. You can also jump into a points league, where stats are awarded a point value, and you're trying to accumulate the most points in either a weekly matchup or over the course of the season. Now it's important to consider what type of league you are in because there are different strategies in each league. Let's walk you through a little bit of that now. We're going to start with head-to-head -head leagues. When you enter a head-to-head -head league, the first thing you need to do is draft your players. There are a few different ways to do this, but I'll touch on perhaps the two largest draft formats, that being snake drafts and auction drafts. It's always a great idea to come into the draft prepared and I've done a lot of that work for you by posting the top 120 players in the league sorted by position. You can see these lists in my playlist, and I'll include a link for you in the description box below. I've also posted a list of players that you should target later in your drafts, and a list of players that you should stay away from. These are important to go over so that you have a good idea of the players that you're going to be selecting. It's also a good idea to consider the type of players that you want to be drafting. For example, I like to draft hitters that have an all-around skill set, like Julio Rodriguez, as opposed to those are, that are elite at a specific skill like Jordan Alvarez. I'll cover more of that later. You can also participate in mock drafts to get a good feel for that format. I'm going to provide a link for you to a recent head-to-head -head snake draft that I participated in to give you a first-hand look of how it's done. Now once you've researched your players and it's time to draft, it's a great idea to enter the draft room early and do a little preparation before the draft starts. Usually, a draft room opens up about 30 minutes before the start of the draft. That gives you plenty of time to get familiar with how the draft works, how many players you're going to be drafting, what position you're drafting in, how many players are ranked, and to queue up some of the players that you want to focus in on in the draft. The queue is going to highlight the player that you choose and keep them on a separate list. Once the countdown reaches zero, it's time to draft. In snake drafts, the position that you draft in the first round reverses in the second round. For example, if you drafted second in the first round in a 12-team league, you would then draft 11th in the second round. If you drafted 11th in the round one, then you would be the second pick in round two. This continues throughout the entire draft, and if you're looking at the grid of all the teams in the draft, the picks would follow a snake pattern, hence the name. Now, I typically draft in three phases. Phase 1, which is the early draft, that being rounds 1 through 8. The start of the draft focuses on choosing the best available player for your team. It's important to collect as many as possible because they will be the backbone of your squad. In head-to-head, -head, I tend to focus on the hitters first. The level of talent drops off considerably once the first few hitters in any category gets drafted, so it's always a good idea to draft as many of those as you can to fill your lineup. Since I like to draft an all-around type of team, I tend to draft hitters that can hit for power and steal bases. I will pay some attention to the position of the player that I'm drafting as it's not really all that wise to draft multiple players who play one position to start a draft. It can cause your team to be unbalanced and you may have, to, you may have to be scrambling to fill a position later in the draft than you would typically like. If an elite pitcher is available when it's my turn to draft, then I would consider picking up a couple of those during the first eight rounds. I will try to have at least five hitters, five or six hitters, and two to three pitchers by the time the eighth round is completed. Phase two is the mid-draft, that being between rounds nine through 16, and this is the most crucial phase. 
I use the queue that I've created to highlight 40 or 50 players that are outside the top 100 players in the league that I'm interested in drafting. If I'm successful in drafting a large handful of these players, then I'll usually feel pretty satisfied with how, the, how that draft went overall. Starting in round 9, my strategy shifts to filling positions that I haven't yet filled in the first 8 rounds. I will also start to shift more of my focus on starting pitching, while keeping an eye on good relievers as well. Normally I'd want to have at least 4 quality starters and 2 closers by the end of this phase. I also try to have my infield set by the end of phase 2. I will still try to get the best players available, but I narrow it down to the positions that I need to fill. By the end of round 16, I'll have about the same number of hitters as I do pitchers. Going to phase 3, that being the late draft, and that's after rounds 17. At the back end of the draft, I will look for players to fill certain stats that I would be hunting. I'm going to focus on completely filling out any missing positions for my hitters within the first few rounds of this phase. And then I'll focus on filling out the bench. A couple of key strategies that I use in head-to-head -head drafts is I will only draft one hitter for my bench and I'll try to have as many backups for each position as I can outside of catcher of course. Multi-positional players are great in these leagues as they can fill a position in a pinch if the main player that you draft in that position is off for the day. As for pitching, I want to try and draft either three or four closers for the team. This is sometimes difficult as there's not likely that many options available for a closer by round 18. As mentioned before, I like to have an all-around team so having three closers gives me an edge in a 12-team league as there's only 30 Major League Baseball teams and not all of them will employ a full-time closer. Thus there's only really a pool of 25 or so solid closers. The rest of the bench spots will be starting pitchers. You want to want more starting pitchers on your bench than you do hitters as you can rotate your starters in and out of your lineup whenever they start, which is usually once or sometimes twice a week. Hitters can start five to seven days in the week, so there's less of a need to shuffle them in and out of the lineups daily, which is why you don't need as many of them on your bench. Once I pick my last player and the draft ends, I like to take a moment to look at how my draft went and possibly key in on some stats that I may need to target in trades or on the waiver wire. I find that most of these drafts take between an hour and an hour and a half to complete. Now here's a link to a recent head-to-head -head auction draft that I participated in. For head-to-head -head auction drafts, each team starts off with the same amount of currency that they can use to bid on players. My strategy is like the one that I have for snake drafts, where I'm going to prioritize hitters early, or in this case, with more currency, and fill up my bench with capable pitchers towards the end of the draft. I've got a few tips that I like to use while doing auction drafts, and they are as follows. Don't blow all of your money early. It's fine to chase after the best player in the league, like Acuna, but don't spend 80% of your budget on the first five players that you draft. It will leave you unable to properly fill out the rest of your roster around these five players and you'll end up picking up from the scraps at the end of the draft. Now personally, I like to spend roughly 50% of my budget on, the, on three or four elite top 30 players and then wait until the rest of the top players have been selected. Once the first 60 to 80 players have been chosen, then I'll start looking at players that I'm interested in and place them in my queue. When it comes time to nominate a player to bid on, I will usually nominate someone that I'm not interested in rostering in hopes that it will lower the amount of available funds in other teams. Now, after that, the fun part begins. Usually around this time, I find that many managers have spent more than I have and have filled more positions. I can start to nominate players that are on my queue, and there should be less managers bidding on them. That means that I stand a better chance at grabbing those crucial mid-round players. I find that I can easily roster many of, the, many of these players while keeping a close eye to ensure that I still have more currency than the other managers. Eventually, the draft will conclude, and if I play my cards right, I should be able to fill my roster with most of the players on my queue and four superstars, and I won't have much of any currency unspent. I find that auction drafts can sometimes take two to three hours to complete. When it comes to rotisserie leagues, my strategy shifts somewhat. One key thing to note is that in most Roto Leagues, there are caps put in place for both games played in each position and for innings pitched. Once you reach those caps, you cannot accumulate any more stats for that position. Therefore, when it comes to time to building my roster, it's more important for me to have more hitters on my bench than pitchers. You are far more likely going to need a position player to fill a spot to ensure that you log the full 162 games for that position than you would need an extra pitcher whose innings would push you over the cap. 
Now here's a couple of links to Roto Snake and auction drafts that I've participated in lately. The early draft phase for a Roto League remains the same if I was doing head to head. I'm looking for the best players possible, although I may pay a little bit more attention to pitchers. After the first eight rounds, I will usually have drafted three or four pitchers. The mid-draft phase, I concentrate more on hitters so that I can fill out my starting lineup. If there's a good pitcher that's available that I can't pass up, then I will grab him for the squad. I like to make sure that I also have at least two closers on the team before the mid-phase is complete. During the late draft phase, I will look to fill out the rest of my bench with as many hitters as I can. One of the things that I try to accomplish is to have at least one backup for each position, including catchers, if possible. The Roto Auction Draft carries similar strategies as the head-to-head -head auction drafts with a shift to filling out the bench with mostly hitters instead of pitchers. For those interested in points leagues, you can enter a league that accumulates points on a weekly basis and you can also enter a league that tracks points over the course of a season. You need to know what is being scored though. This could change your draft preparation and your player rankings. For example, if you take Julio Rodriguez and place him in a league that counts strikeouts, he goes from arguably being a second or third selection to a second or third rounder. For those that count walks, that would add more value to players like Kyle Schwarber and Max Muncy, both of which would traditionally drag down a fantasy team with their low batting averages in a traditional league. If I'm participating in a head-to-head -head points league, then I'm going to draft similarly to a traditional head-to-head -head league, focusing on filling out the bench with mostly pitchers. If I'm participating in a season's point league, then I draft similarly to a traditional rotisserie league, filling out the bench with more hitters than pitchers. Now one important final note. A fantasy baseball league is not won or lost in the draft. If you feel like you drafted a phenomenal team, all it takes is an untimely injury to a key player or two to derail the strategy that you put into place. The key to success in fantasy baseball is to stay active. The preseason is a great time to look at which new players are getting jobs once the regular season starts. It's important to check on your teams daily to make sure that you have the most effective lineups on the field each day. And stay tuned to my channel as I give you helpful insights to keep your fantasy team firing on all cylinders all season long. And that's going to do it here for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like on the video and of course, subscribe to the channel for more content like this. I'm going to sign off for now, but I'm going to catch you guys on the next episode.